put it in front of me. So he looked at me and suddenly pushed over and he said, he said, what are you doing? I was here first. And so I said, okay. And so I put it in back at him. <laughs> and then I was completely rattled. And so um, he got up in a huff and then I called one of my nieces who happened to be sitting in the right place to come over and sit with me and I left the rest distributed. The bus driver never did figure us all out, but that was okay with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, when I came here, I came with my signs and I was prepared for what I found here. However, there was a long period in history of Washington. The second thing I'm going to do is very fast, I'm going to do a hop skip through from 1791 where you had curfew to discourage the number of free Negroes who, who were attracted to Washington. And so they had curfew so early that the theater owner of the Grover Theater, the actor manager, stated that um, he was losing as much as $10 per night because black people had to leave early. And so uh, apparently black people could go to the theater and, and at least sit there and know where the set. Then in 1861, um, nigger heaven was invented. That is, um, the people who are up here, that's where you are now. <laughs> and in the Shakespearean theater, they had two, such heaven. Um, then according to the, the, the Sentinel, um, colored people attended theater in 1883 and apparently um, it, it was well attended. In 1901, Jim Crow was invented and so um, with Jim Crowism, um, black people uh, started uh, orchestrating their own theater and that's when Howard uh, went, the Howard Theater went into uh, black management uh, again and um, it reverted to black management and you had menstrual shows and uh, musical hits and so forth. 1881, 1865, um, I said the Grover Theater had the upstairs. 1883, people were able to sit where they wanted to apparently. Uh, but 1929, 1939, when the National Theater announced a special performance of Green Pastures on March 2nd, 1933, which would be open to all, um, black people showed no enduring importance to the overture at all. They cooled it. Um, one of the very strange things was that at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in 1922, black people were segregated into one area. Um, there was a very good picket line at the Capitol Theater in 1949. I had a ball. I enjoyed it very much. 1946-1954, the National Theater after surviving a loss of weeks of picketing in 1947, closed its doors to all legitimate stage productions. Rather than uh, accede to the demands of the actors' equity that Negroes be admitted to the House. And in 1951, the National Theater adopted the policy that public recreational facilities would be open to everyone. And by mid-1953, movie houses and most other privately owned places of public entertainment in D.C. followed the list. Now for the panel. Uh, Betty has already introduced them. However, I have a very warm and personal feeling to each one of these people, although um, perhaps only one of them knows it. Um, Dr. Ann Cook, uh, I met her when I was a refugee from Jim Crowism. Um, that time I was seeking my refuge by being a member of the Thespian Study Club. And the Thespian Study Club was in its heyday, and Ann was asked to direct a play, the superior play, The Old Maid. And um, I was... Um, I was in the title role and had the distinct honor and privilege of being taught of learning a great deal from Anne's direction. Incidentally, my daughter was, my own daughter, Pat, was my illegitimate daughter in the play. And uh, during rehearsal, she had a way of taking the play very seriously, and when I renounced her, she would cry. And so Anne put the bat all through the rehearsal while I would whisper reassurance to my daughter. But on the night of the performance, I and mean, I think we had five performances with standing room only. On the night, one of the, the first night of the performance, the first night Anne told me, she's a, the child is an actress, let her act. So she cried through that, and it was fine. Uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house at that scene. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and Dr. Anne Cook. Anne. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give you a time frame within which I'm going to speak. Although I was born in Washington, uh, I never lived here until I was a young adult and came back to work um, in theater at Howard University. 
I will be limiting what I have to say to my experiences and relationships in a, over a 12-year period between approximately 1947 and 1958. Uh, that includes uh, the period during which uh, Bowen had reference, when the National Theater was closed. It also covers the period uh, when Washington was certainly not considered a major theater town, and uh, artistically and culturally, Washington was not one of the top five cities in the United States, as it is now one of the two or three in the world. For many of you, it will be difficult to put yourselves back in a time when you did not have a choice of three or four professional productions, which you could witness any night or any after, any day, any day in the week. I'm going to be speaking specifically at first uh, about my experiences with the Howard Players and the Department of Drama. It has been mentioned, it was mentioned in the first panel at noon today, and subsequently, references have been made to Montgomery Gregory and Alain Locke. I do not want anyone here, and there are many who have been in Washington for many years, uh, to forget the fact or think that I'm ignoring the fact that beginning in 1921, I think this is right, uh, the Howard Players, an extracurricular student organization dedicated to high theater, was organized at Howard under the direction of Montgomery Gregory and Alan Locke. I have not looked into that history, reviewed it for this occasion, because I thought this was an experiment in memory, and I should speak from my experience. There is a great difference between that activity, which Sterling Brown, they seem to forget and don't mention him, Sterling Brown picked up and directed the Howard players after the Gregory Locke um, leadership and was doing the Howard players until the time that I came to Howard and I displaced him. But he was good enough to act with us to perform and certainly to counsel and extend ideas which I think we had put forward in the theater uh, with students who went to him on into literature and to writing. So there has been a close, a very effective influence through Sterling on students who came and became interested in theater, whether they went on into uh, literature and writing as Tony Morrison did, or in other aspects of theater as, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't start naming names at this point. I came to Howard to establish an academic department. I'm going to be an educator at the moment. An educational department which was to train undergraduates in the basis, the basics of the theater arts in general. It was an undergraduate major, major. It was related to the philosophy and concept of the humanities. The students had both courses in art and dramatic literature as well as technical courses, courses in movement and speech and acting. My philosophy was that the theater belonged to the arts, and every, every art is built on its craft. Regardless of one's genius, one learns his craft. And I felt that what we could do on the undergraduate level was to give these students a sense of I can by learning what was involved in the variety of crafts involved in the total uh, collaborative effort which we call theater. So students worked in all areas of theater, included in that, of course, was an opportunity for writing for those who could, who, for whom the theater experience excited them in their imagination which they could take out to the written word. And so as there were sufficient number of students to, uh, to merit a seminar in writing, Owen Dobson, uh, who came the second, my second year here, uh, went forward with writers. Sterling helped, we had visiting professors on occasion. The point of view was that theater first is a communal art, it is a popular art, and it is a world art. And that it was important for our students to know the entire spectrum of world theater. The responsibility I saw is threefold. One, to train those students who wanted basics, the basics, not to become great stars, with just four years, who could, uh, but to learn the basics, 
to have a broad view of the theater and its relationship to the humanities and the arts, to develop eye and ear. Two, to serve as a performing center for all of the students, so that a person who spent four years as an undergraduate at Howard, majoring in physics, let us say, who if he went to only two of our five performances a year, over four years, but at least leave Howard University with a sense of what world theater was like. So because there was no theater in the community, no professional theater, we felt that we had a responsibility to provide performances for the community. And our audiences were at least half and half members of the Washington community and members from the larger Howard University uh, community. Our concern was with, as I said, world theater, a part of which would be folk and what today we call ethnic <coughs> theater. There was a very special reason that the department, which then included, uh, after the third year, included James Butcher, Owen Dodson, and me, with occasional people in for, as visitors for one year or one semester. The American theater, American drama, American plays present very few kinds of roles for people, for black people, for people of color. Were we to have limited, or were a student learning his basics, to be limited to only those kinds of roles which, are, which have become stereotypes either through the early cinema, or through Hollywood, I should not say cinema, through movies out of Hollywood, and what then existed as American dramatic literature, their opportunities for training and expression would have been highly narrowed, very delimited. My thinking was that to be prepared to go out and attack this world in either designers, playwrights, actors, directors, they needed to explore as interpretative artists, as creative artists, the entire spectrum, as I have already said, and always to fight from learning what theater it really is, the dangers, the dangers of the stereotypes. That explains in general, and somebody might want to ask questions, I'd like to like, leave why the approach to theater was as it was. Apropos theater in a segregated community. Uh, earlier in the first um, panel, Marty Cobb mentioned that growing up in Washington wasn't so difficult in many ways because so many good things were free. One of the greatest libraries in the United States, L.C., the Library of Congress, was free and open to anybody. The National Gallery wasn't, I don't know how it wasn't there when he was an uh, undergrad, but anyway, uh, there were galleries, art museums, where the best of art could be seen. And the, the best bands played in the parks and you could go for free and without segregation. So that uh, the young person of color growing up in Washington was not deprived of these cultural things. Now, something that concerns me a great deal, the theater arts, the performing, well, the theater drama, the theater arts, and I suppose opera would fall in this category. When you are learning your craft, you must have an ideal. You must have a model. You must know what is best in your field. You must have something toward which you are working. An ear for it, an eye for it, a heart for it. But there must be, you must have the opportunity to see and hear what is the best. So I can go to the library and read the best. I can go to the National Gallery or to the Phillips Gallery uh, and see the best of the representational arts and know where I have to go or where I don't want to go as the painter or the sculptor or the potter and so on. But theater is a, is a cumulative thing, and you cannot sense it, and you do not know what you're drawing and how it is integrated and what the ideal is, unless you can see theater. Even the soloist, the vocalist, can, in Washington then, could hear a great artist perform in the library, in the, uh, the Library of Congress, and the Phillips Gallery, 
uh, in, in some of the universities, an individual artist at the piano singing with the fiddle or the violin. And so the young student looking at his craft hears and says, ah, that's what they're talking about. That's my goal. But then you live, it would not have to be in a segregated community. But if you live in a community where there is no art and no theater, the theater student does not have that model, that model set for him. And it is very difficult to teach. The danger is that whether it be segregation or isolation, which, I mean, how the isolation comes about, be it segregation, discrimination, or a small town in Montana, I hope that doesn't hurt anybody from Montana, uh, the tendency is that one's sense of what is fit and good drops. And a low ceiling of excellence and performance sets in. And that is the great danger. No matter how good the teachers are in the theater arts, and I thought we did exceedingly well at Howard, and I'm very pleased and proud of that association, but we were living in a place where you couldn't say, okay, kids, get out and see for yourself. Now you know what we're talking about. And that is where segregation or isolation hurts the mastery of a craft so that the student can move into becoming the artist and the true and free creative person to create what he wishes in his own manner. That is the big frightening thing, and as I look back on it, the most disappointing and the most dismal thing, I think that is an abiding observation. It's the difference between how, one, how the different arts, the problems one has in mastering his particular art, and the arts do vary, as we know. Do I have a minute left? You have about three. Three minutes, oh, I don't need all that. Um, I could go on and send us getting wound up. I wanted to cross that out because that uh, this is an idea that um, as all of us, I think it's worth you know playing around with when you leave here, it's something to think about. Uh, Betty said, well, toss in some anecdotes, you know, some things, you must remember something. Well, I remember a, a great deal. And uh, this I will not go into great detail. Um, in 1948, my second year here, a part of this program of doing getting a cross section of world theater, I, I we selected to do a play by Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen. Some of you have heard this many times, so just put your fingers in your ears. Um, we elected to do a play by Ibsen, The Wild Duck, and that was my turn to go on first. So I and Ibsen was somebody I was interested in at that time. I directed the play. This is when, this is 1948. The National Theatre, of course, was closed. It so happened that the Secretary General of the United Nations was in Washington with a member of the Stuarting, the Norwegian Parliament, and they were at the Norwegian Embassy. So come Saturday, they were through their conference and meetings and had meetings only on Sunday afternoon back in New York. So they asked to go to the theatre. So they had to be told, you see, that in the nation's capital, one of the largest countries, the wealthiest countries in the world, there was no theater. Great shock. Well, we know that Europe, uh, Europe there's no <coughs> European capital without a theater. Um, I think I can say that safely. I get away with it for the moment. Tremendous shock. Some eager beaver looked, looking through the Washington Post saw this tiny, all we could afford was the tiniest little ad the paper takes. All it said was, Ibsen's The Wild Duck, Howard University, 8 p.m. I don't know why the show took, but we had sold out. And the students who took calls and ran the switchboard had learned that we had a first come, first serve basis. So I got a call at home Saturday afternoon saying, oh, oh, the movies in the embassy have called, and they have some very important guests from Norway and the United Nations, and they want tickets. And I said, they don't have any tickets. Tell them their names will go on the waiting list, and they'll get there 20 minutes early. We release tickets 15 minutes before curtain, and if there are any tickets left, they're welcome. But we do not make any, no special deals. All right. They came, they got seated. If any of you remember Spalding Hall, it was a dismal place. No two chairs match, it was uncomfortable. It was everything. <laughs> uh, so there they were. Two of them with Humboldt, you know, and pork coats and, you know. <laughs> um, so they stayed through the show. And afterwards, when we were checking out the box office, one of the students came and said, 
this a gentleman from the Norwegians want to see you. So I said, well, I asked him to wait just a minute, you know. So then I went out, it was very uh, gracious, but we had to, you know, business has to get done. So this little man from the Stuart team said, after we were introduced, I was introduced, said, what would you, how would you think about bringing this very production to Norway? So I said, you know, I can play this game as well as they can. I said, surely, when would you like us to come? Uh. Uh, so they said, well, can we sit down? Maybe we sit down and talk a little bit. So I said, oh, indeed, you know, pull the chairs around. because nothing was nailed down. Uh, <laughs> we sat, and they said, well, now let's see. This is November, and I'll get back to Norway, and it'll be three weeks. And the storting will not be meeting until in January. And I think I would have to take it up with the storting and see what the Rangers can do. What do you think it would cost? I said, I haven't remembered that day, but I think that could be managed. At which time, Mr. Butcher, who had played, was, had acted in the play, came out in a way to go. So I said, oh, Mr. Butcher. And then, because Mr. Um, Dodson, who'd been busily uh, congratulating actors and criticizing and so on, is, in his best manner, came through, so I called Mr. Dodson, so I had them meet. Well. Maybe we're getting a little late to continue talking. Could we meet for breakfast in the morning, Sunday morning? And then somebody said, well, we'll have breakfast at the embassy. So, so. I said, we'll come to my apartment at 9.30 and have coffee. Oh, splendid. <laughs> so then they left at goodnight and thanked and went on the way. So Beanie and Owen said, what is going on here? What is this foolishness? I won't make, I won't go into this. But anyway, by one o'clock Sunday, we had agreed that this production was going to go to Norway, period. And the following um, August, 30th August, 19, what was it, 49, 27 Howard University players sailed. Now, this is a horrible thing to say, and I, you know, I'm going to say it, but it's horrible. <laughs> you see, if the National Theater <laughs> had been open, <laughs> But nobody like that would have seen our full and feeble production of the wild duck. That's one, that's the humor side. The other, the most important thing was, though, that the students had three months of playing in professional houses, magnificently equipped in backstage with machinery, and so as Todd will appreciate this, that the European theater, theaters were ahead of us for a long time in terms of machinery, equipment, and so on. They had to perform according to professional standards. And they had an experience which many of them have li would have to have lived at least 10 years longer as an individual to have in this country. And a group of them had a concentrated experience in meeting the press, in meeting a curtain time, in meeting other kinds of stage managers in four different languages uh, to hit the boards in a professional manner. They came back with a stature and a learning experience that it would have taken us over a year to have given them. And that's enough. Like, we'll talk later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. The second person um, about whom I have this warm feeling, I'm quite positive that he doesn't know that I have this very warm feeling toward him, but um, I met him met um, when I was a refugee from uh, segregation in Washington also. This time I was um, traveling to New York regularly to theater. There was no theater here and so we traveled. We went to New York and I, I know you can sit out there and say big deal you went to New York but it was a big deal. We had very little money and so we would pool our resources and we would take an excursion to New York and we would um, sleep in the most um, preposterous uh, places in order to be able to afford the tickets. And so I saw Todd Duncan in Cabin in the Sky. I saw him in Lost in the Stars. And I saw him three times in Porky and Beth. Mr. Duncan. <laughs> I'm blessed, doubly blessed, in that I am at the same table with a man whom I really think is a genius in our field of the arts, 
And when I had the great pleasure when we both were teaching at Howard University to be his double par doubles partner in tennis. And now, uh, how much hair do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have very much, but, but our hair is gray now. But uh, speaking of memories, it is a wonderful memory to say that I have played tennis with the Sterling Brown. I love the, uh, the memory. As far as Anne Cook, uh, this lady I've been in love with. I've even told my wife <laughs> for many, many years. We met in Indianapolis. We, her mother was in Gary, is that right? That's right, and, and we met in Indianapolis way back when we both were children, and we both thought we were kind of good looking. I knew she was pretty. <laughs> I am thirdly blessed to have on the right hand side of me a deliciously wonderful, blessed rebel. It's just beautiful, and I loved your story. And I'm going to tell that story uh, many times. I'm going to never forget it. It's a good story. Thank you. Now to the point. Yeah. I believe the subject is the theater in segregated Washington. And so I shall ask you to quickly go back to 1936, though many of you were not even born then. But in 1936, I was in a dilemma. I was working, and I was paying for my house, and I was sending money home for my son to be in school, and, and to find bread and butter uh, for my wife, and my job was at stake. 1936. Don't forget, the subject is segregated Washington. With me, first, it was a case of bread and meat. Not theory. But what do I do next? Tomorrow. What do I do? So I'm asking you to go back to 1936, when you had been in Boston in a certain play for three or four weeks, and then to New York for six or seven months, and on to Detroit and Milwaukee and Cincinnati and Cleveland, and then finally to Chicago for six weeks. And while you are in Chicago, you find that for the first time there's some kind of a sociological mess going on that you ought to go to Washington, D.C. next. And uh, you are told that no Negroes will be allowed to come to see you. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, you had taught at Howard University. And you had uh, been at the university and you knew something about your peers. You know, the Sterling Browns and a lot of others like Sterling Brown. And you felt that you would be remiss of character, of everything that your mother had taught you, if you'd come back home and, and perform in the theater where your own friends and your own peers could not appear. So what did you decide to do? To tuck your tail and say, I'll go? No, you didn't. One night after a performance at quarter of 12, you called 85 people together and you put it to them and said, I want to know how you feel, ladies and gentlemen, but we're, we're to go in three weeks, we're to go to Washington, D.C. But you said, I cannot in good faith perform in that national theater where my friends cannot come to see me. What do you feel? Well, most of them applauded. But the white race is not the only ones that has, uh, that knows what segregation is. They're not the only ones that, that uh, has these thoughts. We have them too. And so there was one 
old lady who was much older than I and had been in the theater longer than I said to me, well, Todd Duncan, what do you, who do you think you are? Uh, Richard B. Harrison went there four years ago in Green Pastures. Do you think you're any better than he is? Well, there was a thump in my stomach, and I felt like saying to her, E tu, Brutus? You too? Have you no character? Are you not willing to pay the full price? Well, there were four or five others that went along with this lady and said that they couldn't afford it, that Mr. Duncan was wealthy and he was making a great salary and he could afford not to go to Washington, but they were only in the chorus and they couldn't do it. Mind you, I say, it's a case of bread and meat. It's a case of living. The theater, we eat too, we act as we have to live, too. There was one person, and I must give her credit, she's in Norway now, that stuck with me. And that was my leading lady. And, I, and for the record, I want to call her name, Anne Brown, who played the role of Bess. And she said, Todd, I'm with you. Whatever you want to do, if you will not play I will not. Well, I knew I had the show then. <laughs> I knew I had the show then, the leading man and the leading lady. So Ann Brown and I, three straight nights from 12 o'clock until 2 o'clock, wrote letters. We got, we went down, asked the man to give us a secretary for two hours for three nights. And we dictated letters, personal letters, to 23 people from 12 to 2 o'clock, three consecutive nights. And I have down the names of the people, some of them, those that answered me in particular. Eleanor Roosevelt, Ralph Bunch, Alphys Hutton, Walter White, Lester Granger, Mary Bethune, Mordecai Johnson, Secretary Ickes, those were some of the people that answered me. Of those, there were three that I talked with at least a dozen times over the telephone. And I would like to give you their names. Ralph Bunch, Alpheus Hunton, Secretary Ickes. In the meanwhile, Secretary Ickes was talking almost daily with Eleanor Roosevelt. So I knew I was in. Well, came four days, and it, we were told, I was told at least, that uh, Negroes could come and sit up there on Wednesday afternoon matinee and Saturday matinee. And they knew that would please me. <laughs> And I said, no, that won't do. And then I heard, you see, in the theater, Miss Cook knows, in the theater, you not only you don't only deal with your peers, you're not only dealing with an agent, you're not only dealing with a manager, but you're, you're dealing with your own union, who's supposed to be protecting you, your own union where you pay your dues. And uh, so the union called me every day for four days, the president of the union. And the last call was this. After they had said, well, Negroes can come and uh, they can come every performance, both night and day, and uh, we will have special seats for them. Anne and I said, that won't do. Then the one of the head of the board of my own union actors equity called and said the board has met and uh, we feel that it is very fair to your race and to you and if you refuse to do it we'll have to find you ten thousand dollars 
and you will not be able to do uh, to get any job or do anything under actors equity for two years and I said number one I don't have ten thousand dollars and number two I don't care if I don't come back for two years it's worth it to me that's what I said I would like to make that part of the story short to tell you that at long last but only one week before one week before the decision came down oh I heard from also from my management from not playwrights I've forgotten who, who, who produced us Hellman and that group Theater Guild Theater, Theater Guild yeah. thank you Don I knew she'd remember everything she knows everything about the theater uh, the Theater Guild and uh, Mr. Munson called me and, was, uh, and said, uh, Todd, you're crazy. You're going against uh, uh, tradition and this is America. You have to understand that. And this is the theater, an American theater. And I said, and this is my soul too. Well, he went against me. Part of the members of the cast went against me. Uh, the uh, union went against and of course as far as the management of the National Theater they were entirely against us to bring it down to the point we won we came here and we stayed three weeks I had one of my dearest white friends to uh, do something under the table because I knew because I had to follow up my soul's conviction and so I just got two hundred dollars and uh, I had my dear white friend to go buy two hundred dollars worth of tickets all over the theater that's what I did and then I wrote nice little notes to my colored friends and I said here, here are some nice tickets two tickets for you because I wanted to be sure they were sitting anywhere they wanted to sit so I thought I'd use this method to be sure that it would be so on the fourth night of the performance the manager who had not spoken to me, uh, uh, who did not greet me, <coughs> came into my dressing room. <laughs> and when he announced to that he wanted to come, that he would he said he told my valet that he would like to see Mr. Duncan after the performance. And I think it must have been the devil in me that made me do it. But uh, when I said, Richard, was my valet, I said, you just stand at the door, and when he comes, will you just announce him? And uh, he did, so he announced it. And I don't know why I said it. I said, tell him I can see him in 10 minutes. I was already free. <laughs> but I thought I just wanted to make him wait. I was in the kingly position and I was going to use my power for once. But he surprised me. He came back right on the dot of 10 minutes, and I had my guard standing there, and he let him in and announced him. And he said, Mr. Duncan, I want to say something to you. I want to thank you for the stand that you took. We've had four nights of performances there has not been one single white person that has come back and asked for their money back. There has not been one situation, not one thing has happened. And I want to thank you. I hope this can go on. And I said, well, you've learned a lesson, haven't you? I said, but you made it very hard for us, very hard for me. But if you've learned the lesson, it's worth it. Now the story is not quite over. We had a wonderful run here, good critics, and the house sold out every night. You couldn't get tickets. And the Negroes came and sat everywhere and looked good. 
And by the way, smelt good too. <laughs> the following two weeks, the house was open to us, to, to Negroes. It was open. Because that two weeks, B. Lilly and Ethel Waters were there in as thousands cheer. I'm giving you history. I'm giving you just exactly what happened. And I was so happy. I don't know, we'd gone on to some other town, but my wife told me, and it was in the papers, and, and we were all happy. I know Sterling was happy. We were all very happy and grateful, too. But the next, when the Lily left and Ethel Waters, the next one was Ingrid Bergman. And the old thing, the old disease came back. And something happened somewhere, but Negroes were not allowed to buy any tickets for the next performance. It's an insidious disease. And when that cancer hits, it returns. And returns when you don't know it's going to return to the theater. But the Lord was looking after us. Miss Bergman says in her Swedish manner, well, why can't they come? Well, it has always been our system here, and so the Negroes were going back to our system. She says, then I cannot, I cannot play here. And she went to the Lizna. The Lisner Theater. Did you know that? In 1936, you youngsters, did you know that? Isn't it wonderful? And she stirred up such a horrible, well, I could say odor, but I want to say, I prefer to say stink. <laughs> uh, she stirred up such a wonderful revolutionary odor that my union took it up and all of the actors, white and black, decided that they would not come to the great national theater. None of them would come. And the bottom line of my story is that the national theater, which flourishes up today, and I'm grateful I go and I'm happy to go, the national theater was not dark one day or two months or one year, but ten. That's my story. Thank you. Oh, bless your heart. We were kids together in school, and his mother taught me French. Yes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's Dr. Max Vaughn. Even from behind the sign. Uh, in New Orleans, I could tell that it was a very beautiful city, very unique, uh, with some special qualities that I dearly love. I still love New Orleans, particularly now yeah. that I see how really beautiful it is because I go wherever I want to go now. Then I had to look from behind those cursed signs. But New Orleans became even more beautiful when the next gentleman visited New Orleans and read his poetry. And although we all spoke a kind of a patois, much, many of us spoke a kind of a patois, we related to the patois that was spoken by this gentleman who read his poetry, and he read it so beautifully. So I have a very warm feeling for Sterling Brown. I should uh, justify my presence on the panel. 
I uh, am not here because I was the tennis partner of Todd Duncan. <laughs> we won the uh, tournament because of his excellent serve, and I would cut him off at the net. I met Todd years ago when he came to a tournament that uh, 